The first reading is from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 20. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is, Jesus. And the second reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do, do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Yet for all their joy they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Okay then. It is actually not enough of us to say that the tomb is empty. It's just not good enough. It's not enough to proclaim Christ is risen. It's not enough to believe in the resurrection. At some point we have to move from the event of resurrection to the experience <coughs> of the resurrection. It's a bit like saying we have to move from believing in Jesus in our heads to experiencing it in our hearts. It is still words that people struggle to understand in church and out of church. For years I battled with this concept of feeling that Jesus loved me, knowing it in my heart. For years, it was only ever in my head, as people would describe. And then one day I realised that I was doing things because I loved Jesus and because I loved his people. And that I hadn't understood it, it already got into my heart. We intellectualise things, very often to our detriment. But that is not to say we should be foolish. That is to say that when God blesses our hearts repeatedly, our minds, sorry, 
repeatedly, it drips down into our hearts. And eventually, without even knowing it, our hearts are transformed. But for many people, it starts in the head. It certainly did with me. For other people that I know, it starts somewhere entirely different. It's with a gut reaction. It's in the heart, as we would say. And it takes a long time to filter through to the intelligence, to the head. But eventually it does. So what I'm beginning to say is it's not enough just to say we believe. We have to know that belief inside us. But don't judge yourself harshly if you haven't got there yet. I don't think these things happen at once, all at once. The Apostle Paul says we are working our salvation out. What he means by that is he's taking time to seep through. We're not there yet. So, hold that in the background of all that I'm about to say. We don't get there at once. Experiencing the resurrected life begins with recognising the risen Christ among us. And what disappointed me then was I'd spelt recognising with a Z. I would never normally do that. I missed it and the spell checkers put it wrong. It threw me though. <laughs> Experiencing the resurrected life begins with recognising Christ among us. This is the gift of Easter. And it is also the difficulty and challenge that we get from today's Gospel reading. Cleopas and his companion are telling each the other disciples Jesus appeared to them on the road to Emmaus. When Jesus again shows up out of nowhere, interrupting their conversation. Now, if you think somebody's dead, and okay, one or two people have seen Jesus and it's been known about, it's a bit of a shock when you sat down to your dinner and Jesus just turns up. Think about it, you think he's dead. You've heard testimony from others, but you still haven't seen. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there in front of you. And he starts with, peace be with you. I think they probably needed peace at that very moment because their emotions would have been all over the joints. But peace be with you. When Jesus says it, it's not like when I say it. When I say peace be with you, it is my most earnest wish for you that you experience peace. I don't have the power to make it. Jesus, on the other hand, has the power to make that peace. So when Jesus says, peace be unto you, peace be with you, if they accept it, their hearts will be filled with peace. For me, you'd also have to have filled my mind with peace. Because as I told you just now, that's where I do all my processing. I don't often process directly from the heart. I direct from my mind. Peace be with you. They hear the voice, but they don't immediately recognize him. They thought that they were seeing a ghost. Their minds know that Jesus was crucified, died and was buried and their hearts are grieving him. They know that dead men don't come back to life. So if you follow that process through, that certain logic, particularly if you are slightly superstitious, you are going to think you have a ghost in front of you. A body, or a person without a body, a spirit without a body. So the tomb is open, but their minds are still closed. They are unable to recognize the holiness that stands among them. And I think they are continuing to live and understand by human categories. They have separated spirit and matter, divinity and humanity, heaven and earth. 
And whenever we make that separation, we close one part of us down. We deny ourselves the resurrected life for which Christ died. And we lose our sense of and ability to recognize holiness in the world, in one another and ourselves. I think sometimes with our friends and colleagues in the world, they can't recognize the wonder of resurrection of Jesus because they've closed their minds to anything that has no apparent rationale that they can understand. And there's a sense of arrogance, isn't there, when we put our own minds above what Scripture tells us to be true. When we put our own minds above what Jesus tells us. But with Jesus and the resurrection, God's not very interested in our categories. I sometimes think in this case, Jesus is a bit like the person that goes into the library and takes off all the cards that index it and says, it, the truth is here, just believe. The trouble with that, of course, is our minds want to categorize. It's the way we are made. But God's not interested in our categorization. God is only interested in the fact that the resurrected life is there for us. And we can't understand it. We just have to accept it. We can't contain the resurrected life. And we can't control it by our thought or by our understanding. And our thought and our understanding in some ways don't enable it to work. It's when it gets to our hearts that it starts to work. Jesus' resurrection compels us to step outside our normal understanding of reality and enter into a divine reality. And doesn't that sound like mystical mumbo-jumbo? It does when I read it. But it's not. What Jesus is asking us to do is prayerfully put aside our own understanding and say, Lord, teach me. Lord, let me feel what it is that you feel. Lord, let me feel the reality of your presence. Lord, bypass my brain. When that happens, a new reality begins with touching and seeing. Flesh and bone, hands and feet, and broiled fish. And Jesus says, look at my hands and my feet. See, it is me. In the reading there today we had, you can see this is not a ghost. A little bit later we'll find Thomas will be told to put his hand into his side. To put his finger into the wounds. But right here we're just told, you can see that this is real flesh and blood. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh. And you can see that I have. He shows them. And then he eats. One of the things I love about Jesus' ministry is it contains a lot of food. Yeah, you're allowed to laugh. Looking at, looking, looking at the rather large man that enjoys food and saying he's pleased that Jesus likes food. But he doesn't like it without reason. There's a reason to his liking food, particularly in this case. It shows people that he can eat. Ghosts don't sit and eat a meal with you. That's got to be flesh and blood. So even to the disciples who know all of the teaching of Jesus, 
They've heard it all. They've heard him say, I'll come back. Death can't hold me. He sits down and he eats a meal with them. And you might say to me, but he doesn't do that for me, Paul. No. But you've got the eyewitness accounts of those to whom it happened. That's why we renovate the renovate. Venerate the Bible. It's why we hold it in a special place. Because it tells us of what happened during Jesus' life and immediately after. Flesh and bone. Things of creation, things of the natural order, things of Mary in whom God was created and Jesus given flesh, things of the ordinary. So it's the very same flesh and bones, the very same hands and feet that appeared to Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, and then just vanished from their sight. Now here something strange we're being told. That's in Luke 24, 31. Something we're being told. That despite Jesus having flesh and blood, bones, having a real presence, He no longer is of this world. There's something different happening. He can just disappear. And I'm glad that worked. I can't often do that. (laughs) He just disappears. And he appears. It makes me wonder what our recreated bodies are like after the resurrection. Can we just appear and reappear in places? I don't know, but it makes me excited. He can now just show up unexpected in the midst of their conversation with others. And in John 20, we find Jesus' hands and feet, his flesh and his bones passing through locked doors. So while at some points of time the resurrected Christ is revealed in and through the created order, he is now no longer bound by the created order. Rather, the resurrected body and life of Christ unite the visible and the invisible, matter and spirit, humanity and divinity. And for me, this is something really quite amazing. We often talk about the Trinity, don't we? We know that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all one being, yet with different ways of appearing. And we have to be so careful in how we describe it, because if we get it wrong, we're heretics. I think I'm probably a heretic quite regularly trying to get it right. But here we have another dimension of that. We've always known that Jesus is both God and man, And now we see Jesus in his proper form, as it were. And you can see him in person, physically. And he can just turn up as and when he wills. Now this is, of course, before the ascension. And it's really quite important to remember the ascension takes God, or God Jesus, up into the heart of God, the Father. But we come to that in a week or two's time. So on the one hand, Jesus has a real body. On the other hand, it's not subject to the laws of time and space. Jesus is something new, something that the world has never known. And we're tied into that unknownness in our belief. And I've heard ministers ask before at this point, and perhaps there's a bit of it in my own head, to which part of Jesus do I want to bind myself? The bit that's 
physical and real, the bit that I can touch. What's the bit that I can't? The bit that has no, no substance in the human form that can just appear and disappear. Or do I want to try and unite all the pair of them together? We live in a world where everything seems to me to be categorised. And we have no category for somebody that can appear physically and yet walk through doors or just appear. And it makes me ask questions about all sorts of things. We say this is this and that is that and we set rules by what we see but God sets rules by what he created. We bind ourselves through our fear and our sorrow, through our losses. We bind ourselves through our runaway thoughts and distractions, our attachments and addictions to how we understand Jesus. And we can't help that. It is what we are. What we have to be willing to do is allow Jesus to change the things that we bind ourselves to him through so that our fears become our hopes, our sorrows become our joys, our losses, our gains, our runaway thoughts and distractions, our godly thinking, our attachments and addictions to things people or beliefs to, to be focused on God. That is what we need to look for. And it is what we need to ask for. For if we are unwilling to allow or trust God to grow us and change us, we bind ourselves to the created order only and we lose sight of the sacred. Some of you might ask why I like art quite so much. I think the reason I like art so much is because in art I can see the created order and yet it speaks to me about things that are mystical. How can two dimensions ever represent three? This is a simple thought. And yet it does. How can reading words change my life? And yet it does. And here I find I'm being asked not to bind myself just to the physical, but also to the spiritual. Jesus can move between both which means that our hopes and our fears, our addictions, all of these things don't have to be bound to the physical. We can move between the two and take healing from God wherever and however we are. Because the resurrected life of Christ reveals that all creation is filled with the glory of God and there is nothing whatsoever that can be hidden from a God that can move between the physical and the spiritual instantly. My wife is a scientist, she can't be here today so I'm free in one way in what I can say and not free in another way. But she's a scientist and she looks to physical matter to understand things. She looks to categorizations. And I'm aware that there's another scientist whose ears just went up. <laughs> but you look, am I wrong? You look for categorizations and you have to put things in the right place so that you can understand them. And that's absolutely fine. I worked in computers for a while. And I know that I had to put things in the right holder 
for it to work. The trouble is God isn't interested in our holders' boundaries. God moves between it all. So when we say that psychology or the doctor says we can't get better and things can't be healed, they might be right. But they also just might be wrong because Jesus isn't really bothered by these boundaries. He can move between the boundaries of matter and spirit. He can move between the created and the yet to be created. Think of it. He created us as we are, but that doesn't mean we're stuck as we are. We can still carry on being created. The resurrected life of Christ is the evidence of that. And it's really quite difficult for us to see sometimes. Christ, our God, longs and desires to open our minds to understand things, to understand the scriptures, to understand all that has been written and spoken and revealed about him. And that's what Jesus wanted to do for the disciples at this meeting. It's not academical. It's not intellectual. It's just something that can happen to us. And it's not just of the heart either, it is of the mind too. The disciples are witnesses. It doesn't mean that as individuals they had all the answers. It meant they had the life that Jesus wanted them to have at that time. They're witnesses based not on what they know, but on who they are and how they live, and their relationship with Christ Jesus, our risen Saviour. You may say to people, I am a Christian, and they will turn around to you and they will quite probably point out your failings. And if they don't do it aloud, believe me, they're probably doing it quietly. If I tell people, I'm a Christian and they've just seen me driving in traffic. They might well know that I've got a temper. They might well know that I get fed up. They might even know that I got shouty. But you see, it's not about that. That is what who we are, not what we are. What we are in Christ is redeemed. So when people might point out to you your failings, that's okay. Don't deny them, don't run away from them. They're there, they've perceived them, even if we sometimes haven't. Take it and say yes, and yet Jesus still cares about me. And yes, he still cares about you. And yes, we are still natural creatures, but there's a bit of us that's not. There's a bit of us that believes in something that goes beyond the natural order, that goes beyond easy categorization. I'm told it's why physicists have less trouble believing in Christ than biologists because physicists know that they don't they don't get it all biologists think they do and maybe to a large extent they do but to you have to be able to believe in the unseen to be a christian as well as in the seen and part of the reason we have these readings we have today is to help us transition between the two positions of believing in the unknown and the unseen and seeing it. We can't actually see it. We have to have eyewitnesses of those that have. I've never seen how a collidron works, one of those big things that bangs atoms against each other, or bits of atoms. 
But I've seen the representations on television, and I have some understanding of what they can do, but I've never seen it. There's lots of things I've never seen and that I'm asked to believe. So why should our faith be any different? People believe in all sorts of things that they can't see. Has anyone here ever seen an atom? If you have, you're up for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> no one has ever seen an atom. Yeah, that's right, we believe in them, you're right. We know they're there. And we know they're there because of the effect they have. We can prove their existence. And we know that Jesus and God are there because of the way they change our lives. And belief in them changes our lives. We don't actually have to be able to thrust our hands into Jesus' side. So then, let's just change tack a tiny bit. Think about a time in your life when you lost track of time. I don't necessarily mean you forgot what time of day it was, but you know when you're doing something and it's hours later all of a sudden and, yet and you haven't fallen asleep. You've just been utterly engrossed in what you're doing. For me, it often happens when, oh, I don't know, when I'm doing something creative. You're totally in the moment. You're totally in the world that you're in. Everything else is happening. You're just not aware of it. And if someone comes to you afterwards and says, what did it feel like to be in that moment? How do you describe that to them? It's very difficult. So then, try a different thing. Recall a moment when your heart changed, your mind changed, how your heart softened. That day when you sensed something new was being offered to you. Possibilities that you didn't even know before were there have just opened up before you. And as you think about that, remember, you are okay, actually. You're good. And God wants you to live. And he wants to open your mind and change your reality in just the same way as he did for those disciples 2,000 and however many years ago. He wants to change not just your mind, but your heart. He wants to give you moments of awe, of wonder, that leave you in sacred silence. Sometimes your eyes will fill with tears and you'll weep, but not from sorrow or pain, but from the waters of new life. There are moments when you say, I never want this to end. I don't want to leave this place. You may have experienced such things at Christian conferences when you don't want to leave. A service where God has been so close to you that you haven't wanted to leave. And you go back to church and you tell the pastor or the minister about it and he goes away saying, I can't do that at church. But it's wrong, we can. We can have moments when Christ changes our lives. And you know, I think today is a day like any other day. And yet Christ is asking you to join with him, to recognize him, and to discover a new life. 
something that is authentic, something that will life, last your life, when you realize that the resurrected life of Christ touches every single part of your being, body and spirit, just as he is clearly body and spirit in this meeting. Don't lose the moment. Hold on to it. Let's not just put this text behind us because it's a little bit awkward. It's much too easy to come here each Sunday and listen to the gospel, hear for better, for worse, and then go back to life as normal. Don't let that happen. Your life is just too important. Carry the text with you over the next week or so. Lift up your eyes. See that the risen Lord is physical. Lift up your heart and know that the risen Lord is spiritual. And then you bring them together in you. And your mind and your body are in line with Christ. Will it happen instantly? I don't think so. Can it happen in a week? Probably not. But can it happen? Yes, it can. Let the voice of Christ open your mind to understanding. Sit with your mind open. Pray with it open. Wrestle with the words of God. And then trust them. And as you catch a glimpse of the risen Christ and your own changing being, drop me an email. Let me know what God has said to you. Phone me. Let me know what God has said to you. Drop by and tell me all about it. Only you can be the witness to what God does inside of you. Only you can be the witness to how you change when you give time to God. People sometimes say to me, Paul, it's great that you have this privilege to sit and read the Bible and study. It's just fantastic privilege. But all the doing and all the busyness of life sometimes seeks to push out the thing that actually matters is that when you have read the words of Christ, dwell with them. I love this thing where you read this passage of the Bible every day that Matt's been doing. But I want you to take it one step further. Take just one line, two words sometimes, and sit with those words and dwell with them. Because the words of God are there to inspire you body, soul, and spirit, the whole of you. And that takes time. For some of you, sitting down and waiting for that to happen is just an utter impossibility. It's not your personality type at all. For others, you might be doing something else, but thinking about it. Uh, my wife, I know, often thinks things through when she's driving. Let's God speak to her when she's driving. If you're driving in and out of London every day, there's a lot of time when you're doing not very much. Other people do it when they're doing the cooking or doing the washing up. For some of us, we have to sit and meditate and take the time. But it's then that you realize that the God, Jesus, who is both physical, because he's there and can be touched, and spiritual, because he just passes through all boundaries and categorizations, actually wants to talk to you. And you are important enough for him to speak to. Every single one of you is important enough for, you to, for him to speak to.
So I want to say, you are all witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. You just don't always realize it. Tell people about it in language that they get. Become it by thinking on it and praying on it. You are witnesses. That's you and me. We are witnesses. Amen. Good morning, everyone. There's going to be a lot of pregnant pauses during the prayers because I would like you to pray your own prayers. I'm aware that we all have the things that lay on our hearts, that God lays on our hearts, and sometimes we don't take time out. I know I'm very bad to take time out and bring them to God. So this morning, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Let's start. By giving thanks to our Lord and Saviour, we've just sung his praises, and now let us just thank him with our hearts and with our minds. Thank him that he has drawn us close to him, that he listens to us, that he's with us, that he loves us, and that all that that means of his great love for us. Lord, I ask that you forgive us our doubts, but you still love us in our doubts. And I ask that daily you will open our hearts more and more to your love, that you may know of your love, that we may feel your love in our minds and in our hearts. Lord, we pray for all those in authority, for all the wars and conflicts, Lord, I know I can't listen to the news these days. I just want to weep, and I feel so helpless. And in those moments, I need to turn to you. We need to turn to you and lift those things that upset us, that concern us, to you. So let's just take a moment to pray for those in authority, that they will be willing to listen to reason, to sense, that they will put the needs of the number, the great number of people that are suffering before ideology and greed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, we pray for our own church. We pray that we will be open in our community, open to our community, and that we will serve our community, and that we'll be aware of how to serve our community. I thank you for the success of Hope Cafe on a Monday morning, the people who regularly come and enjoy a quiet time with friends, a natter, a snack for lunch. But I thank you for the warmth and the welcome that is felt in that space. I thank you for all the children who have grown up in this community regarding the church as a safe place, a place where they can learn of you and that they can, without realizing it, feel your love because of your believers because of the time people have taken to interact with them and I pray that we will continue to be an open place a welcome place Lord in your mercy hear our prayers Lord, we all have relationships with our friends, with our family, and I thank you for all our friends. I thank you for the support they give us when life is tough. I thank you for our families. But families cause concerns. Life is never quite smooth. So let us take a moment to think of all the difficulties and stresses and strains that people are experiencing and pray for them as we know them.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, thank you for listening to our prayers this morning and listening to us whenever we pray, whether it be when we're meditating or whether we are sitting in a traffic queue. We thank you that you are there with us. And I ask now that we may know your peace in all that we think and do. Amen.